Now for the hard part. That's the focus of tonight's angle. All right, all weekend long, I was still kind of processing, like many of you, Trump's historic comeback. The bogus lawsuits, the frivolous indictments, the relentless defamation, Kamala's $1.2 billion war chest. I mean, not even two assassination attempts could break him. Even his most strident critics are recognizing the opportunity he has to reshape Washington. He swept every battleground state. He increased his margins in New York and California. Trump is riding into Washington, whether anyone, I mean, just the, the, the political reality is that he is politically as dominant and strong as he's ever been. Holy Toledo. All right. Trump gained ground in 49 states and the District of Columbia. But of course, the question is, how much support can President Trump get on Capitol Hill? Because, look, he outperformed pretty much every Republican who ran this go-around. Trump's agenda, which he specifically campaigned on, should be the Republican agenda. And his focus was not just the border, not just the economy, but our trade policy, our defense policy, too. So given that the GOP likely controls both houses of Congress, it'll be a narrow majority in the House, it's realistic that Trump voters expect his policies to be swiftly moved through Congress. But at a minimum, and I mean a bare minimum, President Trump should be able to rely on Republicans that he helped to regain the majority in the Senate. They wouldn't have beaten Sherrod Brown without Trump. They wouldn't have beaten Casey without Trump. Or maybe not even John Tester without Trump. And under these circumstances, especially Again, with that small House majority, the position of the Senate majority leader is even more critical. Now, just so you all understand this, and there's no reason you would have to know the intricacies of, of, of Hill inner workings here, but as a practical matter, no bill can get to the floor of the Senate, and no amendments can be put on that bill and voted on in the Senate without the support of the majority leader. It just does not happen. That's why Mitch McConnell is so powerful. Now, right now, there are three candidates for the position. Two of them, John Thune from South Dakota and John Cornyn from Texas, are both seen as disciples of Mitch McConnell. And both have a history of being fairly critical of President Trump, who they'd prefer not wade into the internal Senate deliberations at all. My preference would be, and I think it's probably in his best interest, to stay out of that. These uh, Senate uh, secret ballot elections are probably best left to senators, and, and he's got to work with all of us when it's all said and done. Now, I understand why the Senate wants to preserve its independence. I get it. But at the same time, let's be real. They all owe their majority status to him, Donald Trump. And think about it. When McConnell worked with the MAGA Republicans and the MAGA agenda, like on court nominations, uh, the USMCA, the tax bill, they got stuff done. It was great. But when they're at cross purposes, as you saw with that Langford Schumer immigration bill, that fiasco, or the absurd infrastructure bill, the results are just horrible. The people have spoken. Trump has won Texas, where Cornyn's from, South Dakota, where Thune's from, three times in a row. So it is logical for voters in those states to believe their lawmakers will work with him, not against him, to advance the agenda, and certainly not throw monkey wrenches at it. Now, we have an incredible, and this really is a once-in-a-generation chance, Charlie Kirk was right when he said that last week, to make a difference in America and to enact policies that the voters have been wanting for years. We have no time to waste, which is why over the weekend, Trump urged whoever gets the leadership role to agree to recess appointments, because sometimes the votes can take two years or more on key um, cabinet secretaries and other positions, which is what the Senate did last go around. And Trump added, we cannot let that happen again. So John Cornyn is trying to get around the recess appointments by promising to keep senators in session even over the holidays to get all Trump's people through. And those are nice words, and maybe that, that'll happen. But Trump does not have the luxury of time. 
And even if his agenda is stymied by the usual swampish uniparty maneuvers, the Republicans are going to get wiped out in 2026 and maybe in 2028 if they try to slow the agenda down. And what, <laughs> after everything that he's been through, everything the country's been through, what a travesty it would be if Trump's historic victory is undermined, not so much by Democrats in resistance, but by his own party. How do you think voters would react to that next time they hear in a call or an email from the RNC? And while we're at it, why are these Senate leadership votes secret anyway? Look, if you disagree with President Trump, that's your right. Disagree with him on whatever it is, deportations or on uh, tariffs on China. Why not, though, stand and be heard? Others have done that in the past. Let's not play hide the ball anymore. That's not what we're into. We never have been. No more killing essential legislation in committee. President Trump deserves a fair hearing and a vote on the policies that he campaigned on relentlessly. And if senators or congressmen, they take issue with what he's saying, then vote against those measures. And then let the voters decide the fate of those legislators or senators when they're next up for re-election. Might be worth remembering Pat Toomey or Jeff Flake or Liz Cheney or Adam Kinziger. See it how it worked it all out for them. We don't elect senators to be part of a club. They're supposed to be representing the interests of their states. And the voters in their states have been very clear. They support Trump. The other candidate for the Senate Majority Leader is Florida's Rick Scott, who's been a stalwart supporter of President Trump since his first term. Scott has also said this. How do we get Trump's agenda done? How do we get his nominees done? How do we codify his executive orders? That's what's, that's, what's on, that's what's up for this leadership race right now. We have a mandate for change. So number one is who is going to represent um, all the Republican voters? Bingo. Of course, he's right on that. But Punchbowl News is reporting that some senators who don't support Scott are annoyed and they feel bullied by the growing online chatter. Now, I was... Talking to my kids about this, we're driving around in the car. I said, Imagine boys being a U.S. senator and feeling put upon by voters mobilizing online. I mean, isn't that politics in the modern era? That is the town square. Now, this all gets more interesting because Elon Musk, who's helping President elect Trump, is supporting Rick Scott. At this hour, Scott's online army is mobilizing and flooding Capitol Hill with calls and emails which, according to Axios, has left some senators livid and frustrated, with aides warning that it could even cost Scott votes. Again, the source speaking to Axios is anonymous. Typical swamp move. But if they're so livid, if they're so frustrated, they need to come on the angle and tell us why that the American people shouldn't have anything to say about this online or anywhere else. Again, no one is disputing the separation of powers concerns. But the Senate is not supposed to be run like the Bel Air Country Club, where a membership committee can blackball someone in secret. And I was thinking about this also. Notice how the Democrats always seem to stay united and jam through, ram through their priorities. So I say let's beat them at their own game. Let's, let's unite behind the America First agenda that the voters have made abundantly clear they want implemented as soon as humanly possible. And that's the angle. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.